The protagonist, Choi Si Wu, has been struggling with his overweight all his life. One day, he confesses his love to his girlfriend, but she rejects him. When he returns home, he decides to end all his diets, but he can't break his promises and eat salad again. After finishing dinner, the young man went for his jog, where he was met in an unknown place by Judge Mangatai, who grabbed him and took him to the world of yokai, where he explained to the young man that he was a chosen participant who would take part in a great festival to become the king of yokai. To test the boy's strength, the old man makes him fight against the monster Jiagugui. After winning, Choi wakes up as a half-goblin and has a dream in which he talks to his friend. When he woke up, he saw Mangadai and an unfamiliar girl next to him. The judge explained that there is a law that forbids yokai from entering the human world, and if Shiwu does not win, the spirits will again do whatever they want to people. After finishing the conversation, the old man ordered Seol Wa, a member of another yokai clan, to train the new member, and then she would be able to enter the human world. Agreeing, the girl told her student what to do and ordered him to eat his opponent to increase his strength. However, she did not take into account something, and the greedy goblin nature chose to sacrifice her, not Jiaguji. After a fierce battle, the fox won, and when she saw Shi Wu dying, she kissed him to save him, transferring her energy. When Choi woke up, after a brief explanation, the girl began her second lesson ordering the boy to fight against a yokai who had lost his mind. After quickly finishing the fight with boxing techniques, the protagonist wondered how he could eat the monster now. However, the fight was not over. Realizing that his body was regenerating, Choi easily won. After this event, the young man was approached by Seo Mi, a 40-year-old girl who came to give him a reward. Back in the real world, the first thing Shi Wu did was call his friend, asking him to cover for his long absence. Over a home-cooked meal, Seo Mi handed Choi a scroll used as a telephone in the yokai world and coins with the ghost treasure. Suddenly, an emergency message appeared on the scroll. Because of this, the girl had to leave her friend. While protecting civilians from monsters, Magpie meets her older brother, Goya. After understanding the situation and thinking it over, Seo Mi realized something. So she immediately left her brother and headed to Shiwu. Meanwhile, the protagonist felt the enemy behind him and threw him into the ground, starting a fight. Suddenly, someone else intervened in the fight. It was an exorcist who helped the protagonist defeat the snake man. After the fight, when Shi Wu heard the shaman's voice, he realized that it was his friend Yushin. Did you like the story and want to continue? Then like it, leave a comment, and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss new videos. After the fight, in the parking lot, Yushin let go of his mask in surprise and headed for his friend. Grabbing the guy, the shaman asked him how it happened. Even without Shi Wu's body, how could the young man hold out against the monster? Interrupting him, Choi said he was having trouble breathing. Thinking that his friend had received a dose of poison, and an unusual one at that, the shaman said that talking could really wait. Suddenly, the traces of poisoning began to disappear until they disappeared completely. Seeing this, Yushin was very surprised by this regeneration. Hearing a rustle behind him, the exorcist turned around, but his victim had already fled, leaving a trail of blood behind. Looking at the snake's escape, Yushin, irritated, noticed that this was out of the ordinary. A minute later, his friends were already outside. Starting a conversation, Shiwu asked if the boy was okay. Lowering his head, the shaman replied that he was not fucking okay. That snake escaped, and another friend he had been friends with for the past three years turned out to be a half-blood yokai, and a goblin at that. After saying this, Yushin began to grumble to himself, thinking about this situation out loud, right in front of Choi. Turning to him, Shiwu said that the boy had never mentioned what kind of training his family had done. Sighing, the shaman confirmed this, saying that it was his family's duty to train and slay monsters and he himself is not an idiot to waste time. Besides, there are six months left. Hearing this, the protagonist thought that Yushin already knew about everything. With this speculation in mind, Choi asked if yokai often visit the human world. To this, the exorcist replied that it hadn't happened often before. If monsters were fighting each other, no one would care. Unfortunately, over the past hundred years, they have tried to kill humans several times. Recently. 
Things have changed a lot. Listening to his friend, Shi Wu asked how recently? With absolute seriousness, Yushin began to say that for the yokai, humans are real dope. Those who want to become king are willing to do anything. Now they don't just absorb part of a person's energy, they eat it all. A month ago, the number of missing persons began to grow, especially in densely populated areas. Even if there is no direct evidence that the yokai did it, in most cases, the houses were partially destroyed and covered with blood. This was the first time. When Yushin stopped talking, he saw something strange. Frightening his friend, the guy grabbed for his blade. Suddenly, something landed behind Choi, radiating a glow of magic. A second later, the protagonist saw Siolmi, who was asking with a sad look if the boy was okay. She was really sorry for falling into such a childish trap. Interrupting her, the shaman drew his blade and told the crying girl to stay away. One more blood, and she would die. Watching the situation, Choi tried to stop his friend. However, the latter, still holding his blade, said that the stranger was not a human, but a yukai. She probably knew the concept of following the law, so he gave a warning instead of attacking. It was all her fault. The yukai must have told Shi Wu about the exam that will allow him to visit the human world. These creatures are monsters. Even though they look like humans and have different personalities, their true guts remain the same. Greedy for the power and taste of blood, they can eat their own kind. It doesn't matter what the blood is, Shi Wu is still human. This is his home world, so he doesn't need permission to be here. They kidnapped him, and now they're saying he needs to become a monster to come back? What nonsense. After hearing this, the magpie looked down, thinking that she understood exactly what they were talking about. From Choi's point of view, it was as if he was in the center of a hurricane. But, his name is already in the register. Now he is a resident of the yokai world, and no one's opinion matters. If we put aside all emotions and look at the facts, this breaking of the rules will not end well. Mangadai will be angry with both Shi Wu and his friend. You need to resolve this issue before it becomes a problem. Is it possible to escape in this situation? Just look at the shaman's aura, and it will immediately become clear how strong he is. Maybe Go Yu or Siolwa managed it, but she won't be able to. However, it was time to do something. With these thoughts in mind, the girl stood in a fighting stance, saying that she was Shi Wu's guardian, so she had to take him away. To this, Yushin said that she wanted to ignore the warning. He would have to. Suddenly, something hit the shaman, pushing him aside. Seeing that it was Choi, the exorcist asked what he was doing. Unexpectedly, the sword was also stolen from Yushin's hands. Grabbing it, the protagonist began to examine the engraving on the blade. The puzzled shaman thought that his friend was being held under hypnosis. But Choi himself said that he didn't know about the blood. However, there is no denying that the yokai eat their relatives. He had recently eaten them himself. This news surprised Yushin. Meanwhile, he continued to talk about how he was told that the monster had lost the right to be called a yokai. But he can't know what is true and what is not. In any case, he became a killer to protect himself and his family. And he has no plans to stop there. He doesn't plan to hurt people, but he will continue to eat yukai if it helps him become stronger. Even if it means risking his life. Listening to this, Seol Mi began to worry. While Yushin, worried about his friend, said that the boy didn't need to go that far. His family. No, even he himself can protect his mother and Shi Wu himself. Listening to the shaman, the protagonist dropped his sword. Because of this, he fell into the ground between his friends. At that moment, Choi turned to the exorcist and interrupted him, with a tight smile on his face, saying that his goal was to become the king of the yokai. This information surprised not only Yushin, but also Seol Mi. Worried about his friend, the shaman began to say that the boy must have gone crazy. Does he even know who the yokai king is? Choi replied that he didn't know everything, but all he knew was that he had a chance, and he had to take it. If he does, the world will not have to turn upside down. And don't let the shaman look at you like that. In this situation, there is no other choice. Maybe it will work out, maybe not, but in the end, that's not what matters. A guy wants to control his own destiny not sit around waiting for a possible future. He wants to try, and the consequences are not important. Hearing this, 
Yushin gritted his teeth in despair. Pulling out his sword, the exorcist said he understood. Let his friend be human or yokai. As long as his intentions are pure, he doesn't need to justify himself. However, if he ever crosses the line, he will die at the hands of Yushin. Rubbing his neck, Choi said that this was fair. If the need arose, he would probably do something terrible. With that said, Yushin lifted his mask, asking what the guard's name was. The girl immediately replied that her name was Siolmi. On the Korean peninsula, she plays the role of a messenger. Upon hearing this, the shaman put on his mask and addressed the yokai and apologized to them for interfering in the yokai affairs, saying that he had heard that even they had laws that had to be obeyed. Therefore, if something happens to Shi Wu, then he will use his powers as a shaman of the Starry Hall to kill all the guilty without mercy. As Yushin ended the conversation, he turned to walk away, adding that she shouldn't worry about his mother. After giving his friend a sad look, the protagonist simply watched the exorcist's figure move away. As he watched, Siomi fell to her knees and said with tears in her eyes that she was shaking, thinking that they would die here. This is the first time she has seen a shaman. Are they all so scary? Intervening in the conversation, will you surprise Choi by saying that this exorcist stands out even among his clan? Looking at her brother, Siomi asked him if he had really followed her. Yokai replied that he had no other choice. He realized what the girl's plan was. Not knowing anything about the enemy's strength or their number, she simply went to the center of the action. If her opponent had been stronger, she would have been eaten as an appetizer. After hearing this, the magpie was a little sad. Meanwhile, the young man was already addressing the same goblin. As he approached it, we well, thought about how yokai who descend from an animal are called beastmen. Many of them are attached to the appearance and instincts of their common ancestors. As they grow stronger, they not only gain the ability to transform into humans, but their true appearance becomes less and less like their ancestors. Such yukai or all members of their family are called ghost beasts. Those who are one step higher are beings who have surpassed their ancestors. In the past, they were called divine beasts. They were once worshipped by both humans and yokai. With these thoughts in mind, Guiyu greeted the goblin and introduced himself by extending his hand, saying that if he wanted to become the king of the yokai, he would have to fight him Guiyu, a representative of the Black Turtle Clan. Smiling, the yokai extended his hand as a sign of friendship. While shaking hands with him, the protagonist thought that the guy across from him had changed somehow. Suddenly, Siomi started shouting that Shio shouldn't shake hands. Hearing this, Choi turned toward the girl. She was looking angry, asking her brother what he was trying to do right after he showed up. Today was already a difficult day. Smiling, Guiyu said that there was no law that would not allow him to do so. After saying that, the happy young man grabbed the goblin's hand, saying that this situation was funny. The half-goblin is so confident that he will become the king of the yokai. As he said this, Guiyu bit his finger using yokai magic. A magical circle appeared on the ground, and the boys found themselves in it. Using the teleportation technique, the yukai transported himself and his opponent to another place. Under the night sky, somewhere near the lake, a light appeared from the teleportation magic. After being transported, Choi fell to his knees trembling in pain. Looking at this, Guiyu said that the boy was stronger than expected. After the first and sudden teleportation, not many people would be able to stay on their feet. Besides, the guy doesn't even seem surprised. Getting to his feet, Shiwu asked if the yukai wanted to eat him. Shrugging his shoulders, Guiyu said that this was the most likely scenario. However, before they begin, he has a few questions. Does the young man play computer games? Surprised, the young man cautiously replied that he did when he was in middle school. But since he went to high school, he hasn't played anything. Hearing this, Guiyu asked him what his favorite genre was. MOBA? Shooters? RPGs? Not understanding what was going on, Shiwu said that he rather liked action RPGs. He doesn't like online games. They always feel like the highest bidder wins, not the best player. Satisfied with this answer, the yokai began to smile, confirming Choi's words. Noticing that something was headed his way, Siwu finally heard the words that the two of them would have something to talk about. After that, an unknown magic flew into the ground. Jumping to the side, 
avoiding harm. The protagonist saw a giant crystal in the center of the lake. After that, the guy turned around, looking at how the next crystal attack was already flying at him. And then, another volley of ice magic, that powerful spell that destroyed the ground around him. Looking at this, Wu Yu turned to Shi Wu, saying that the boy was quite fast. The latter, looking pleased, began to think that the goblin was not trying to escape. On the contrary, it was aiming at him, waiting for the right moment to reach the target. The kid has already decided for himself who his new target is, and he must destroy it. For a beginner, he's doing really well. His perception, his talent for battle, it is difficult to overestimate them. But now his ability to learn is the most striking. Today, the boy has already seen the fighting style demonstrated by his opponent. He does not relax his attention, being ready for any danger. The solution he chose is a consequence of everything he has seen this day. With these thoughts in mind, Wu Yu saw something striking. Choi was already flying at him, swinging his fist to strike with magic. He fired his volley of lightning magic right at the enemy, destroying everything around him. Meanwhile, the Yukai continued to think about the fact that the newcomer had a sleeve. This is a Yukai treasure that can release the power and energy of the one who uses it. And there's one more lesson to be taught. Even if it looks like the attack worked, you should never relax. While Guayu was thinking about this, Choi had already attacked with his spell, which flew through the cloud of dust he had kicked up. Looking at this, the protagonist thought that he had figured out what to do with this energy, though not quite, but he had already figured it out. The energy that permeates his entire body gives him goosebumps. It originates from the lower abdomen. According to his personal feelings, he has a little more than half of it left. 60%. He spent 10% on that big beam. Then, several smaller beams, probably about 3% each. If the guy reaches zero, he will probably fall into that state of hunger again. In this case, the boy cannot waste energy thoughtlessly. While the protagonist was thinking about this, a surprised Guayu said from under his shield that he hadn't even thought he would have to use his icicles so quickly. Did he really underestimate the enemy that much? The first stage of the battle was already over. Hearing this, Choi said that he didn't care about the young man's strange way of speaking. Is he really trying to eat him? He just doesn't seem threatening. Smiling, the yokai replied that it was really hard for him to imitate bloodlust. The newcomer is right, he has no personal animosity towards the boy, and he does not want to eat him. It's just that his brazen words hurt the turtle. Does the boy even know who the king of the yokai is? To this, Shiwu said that the title was obvious. He is a king who rules over the yokai and issues laws that must be obeyed. When Guiyu heard this, he asked why the election of the king was reduced to a simple fight. And why does it only happen once every 666 years? The being who will rule all the yokaias for hundreds of years is chosen by a single festival where anything can happen. Seeing Choi's reaction, Guiyu explained that the yokai follow this tradition because it is their unbreakable law passed down from generation to generation. They are creatures guided by their desires and instincts. The mere fact that someone stronger has established their own order in their world is not enough for everyone to follow it. To avoid the yokai from fighting and devouring each other, the ancient yokai created a safeguard, the king of the yokai. Because of the nature of the yukai, they would one day fall prey to their desires. To prevent this, they all agreed that they needed a guardian a being who will require the subjugation of all the yokai in the world, giving them life in return. That's what a yokai king is. Fortunately, over the millennia, all subsequent kings managed to maintain the stability of the world without major events. Their policies sometimes differed, but the basis, the survival and prosperity of the yokai, remained the same. With one exception, the current king. Imagine that a human government once issued an order. No human is allowed to eat meat anymore, no matter what the circumstances. Would the world be in chaos? Hearing this, Choi said that there would have been a lot of protests. And if the law had not been repealed, it would not have ended with protests alone. Confirming this, Guiyu said that they have had this law in place for 666 years. If you look at the situation from this perspective, everything will become clear. How important their king is to the yokai and what sacrifices they are willing to make to protect this ancient tradition. But now even their patience is running out. 
Hearing this, she will clarify that if the next king extends the law, it is unlikely that the yokai will be ready to continue to follow it as before. Confirming this, Guiyu said that he liked the way the guy grasps everything on the fly. And so it is. Even if the law is a king's decree, few people will follow it. He may be the most powerful yokai, the king, but in the end, if the absolute majority are against his authority, he will not change much. And if it comes to that, it can end not only with the deprivation of the title. The very essence of the need for a king will be called into question. On that day, his power would become nothing but history. Now does the young man understand what I'm talking about? With that, the turtle walked over to Shi Wu and repeated what the boy had said earlier about how he would continue the law, adding that not many people would tolerate such a thing. Those who are younger will probably smile and move on, but those who are over a thousand will tear the boy apart. But in fact, it is clear who gave the goblin this hope. Seol Mi is a good kid, not like the other yokai. The only problem is that the girl hasn't had time to see the world yet and gets attached to new friends too quickly. Having listened to his interlocutor to the end, Choi asked if the yokai meant that he should take back what he had said. Confirming this, Guiyu said with a smile that he had initially thought that the newcomer was one of those who could be crushed in the beginning. But now his opinion has changed. The guy is a fast learner, and his fighting potential is not bad. So let him serve him. If the boy helps the turtle become the king of the yokai, he will be allowed to rule the Korean peninsula. It's a good deal, isn't it? He won't be able to protect people completely, but his family will definitely be safe. Hearing this, the protagonist, surprising the enemy, asked how strong Go Yu was. What are the chances of him becoming king? Looking at Choi, the yokai replied that he was not the strongest in Korea, but that there would most likely be no one stronger than him at the festival, because there is an age limit. After listening to him, Shi Wu agreed. After that, he extended his hand to the surprised interlocutor, saying that if it would help protect his loved ones, then he would accept the offer. Satisfied with this outcome, Wu Yu shook hands, saying that the guy hadn't disappointed him. Interrupting him, Choi began to say that he wasn't really ashamed of it. After saying that, Shi Wu began to gather magic in his hand, right in front of the bewildered yokai. Meeting the enemy's eyes, the protagonist said that Guo Yu's words were not trustworthy. In addition, the former offered to shake hands with the turtle, immediately deceiving and attacking him. To end the conversation, the goblin used serum. Compared to the power he had used before, it was something on a completely different level. 60% of the young man's remaining energy. He put everything he had into this attack. It was not an instinct, but a technique that he used consciously for the first time. The syringe is a mountain throw. The young man left all doubts behind. Now there was only determination and courage inside him, which he put into his most powerful conscious blow. Leaving behind a crater, Choi sat tired from his kick, thinking about how his body could not stop shaking. This is due to the use of energy beyond the limit. Restoring stamina. Healing wounds. For the protagonist, who has put everything he had into the punch, leaving only a drop of energy in him, these two options will not be available for some time. After the energy reserve is completely depleted, Shiwu is no longer able to continue the fight. Unlike Guayu, who stood next to his opponent and said that he would hold back his bloodlust until the last second and then risk his life by putting all his strength into one attack. It seems as if the heavens themselves had rewarded the newcomer with a talent for combat. To defend itself from the attack, the turtle used a unique magic, the North Pole, which allows you to manipulate water and freeze it in a certain radius around the user. If not for the difference in strength between them, then the boy would have won, no doubt, and taken the energy he deserved. But now the boy can only say his last words. As he said this, the yukai smiled predatory. Hearing his enemy, Choi replied that there would be no last words. Even if he wanted to say something before he died, it would definitely not be to Guoyu. And since the guy started the fight ready to kill and eat, he was also ready for his own death. Besides, they weren't done yet. These words surprised the yokai. Standing up, Shiwu continued to say that if the turtle expects him to simply beg for mercy, it is too early for that. At this point, the fire in the protagonist's eyes grew brighter and brighter. I wonder what it is? An intention to catch the enemy in a mistake? Or, 
Perhaps it was the spirit of a goblin that had awakened without the master's knowledge. At this situation, Guiyu smiled, saying that the guy was not eloquent. And this was considering that the guy could barely stand on his feet. Okay. With that, the yokai stretched out his hand to grab Choi. However, to Shi Wu's surprise, the turtle simply smiled and said that the boy had passed. As expected, until the very end, the boy did not disappoint him. His enthusiasm even began to seem natural. Puzzled by this turn of events, Choi asked what it meant to pass. To this, a joyful Gua Yu replied that he would now cheer for the boy. After all, what's the point of rooting for someone who has no chance of becoming a yokai king? Surprised, Shi Wu stepped away from the turtle, saying that the boy himself had just told him why he shouldn't become the king of the yokai. Confirming this, Gua Yu added that everyone is looking forward to the new king. But he's not thrilled with the idea of a yokai knight. Since early childhood, he hasn't liked the noise and hustle of the yokai world. There was no point in their fighting and killing. Yet everyone treated it as if it was the way things were supposed to be. Compared to their world, the world of humans is much calmer and quieter. People also sometimes live in the midst of chaos, but at least here you can choose what you like best. He especially likes that the human race can enjoy its laziness. Comic books, games, novels, movies, there are no such things in the world of the yukai. Instead, they choose to eat people. If the world changes so much that people can no longer create such things, it will be a real tragedy. After listening to him, Choi said that he understood what he was trying to tell him. Then what's the point in cheering at all? Yokai can become a king himself and, interrupting him, Goyu said, smiling, that it was a waste of time. The Korean Peninsula has the highest chances of winning, but there is one small problem with becoming king. Most of the festival's favorites are heirs of families with a long lineage. They inherited their power from their ancestors. However, more importantly, they have techniques for using ancient magic optimized and passed down by their ancestors. Even if two techniques have the same power, the one who inherited the result of thousands of years of trial and error will be stronger. People have an expression, born with a golden spoon in your mouth. It's the same story here. Hearing this, Choi clarified that in this case, being born into such a family is like being born the heir to a corporation. It means stress and pressure from the family. Confirming this, Guiyu began to say that the pressure is an understatement. In training, they were pushed almost to death. If someone was born with talent, the whole clan would tell him day and night that he should become the new king of the yokai. No one cared about the child's wishes. When you become a clan representative, you automatically swear to put the interests of your family above all else. If you are not satisfied with this, then you will be killed and a new representative will be elected. After hearing this explanation, Choi thought that even if they were not human, it was cruel to have your whole family as enemies. While Shi Wu was thinking about this, Guiyu pointed at his friend and said happily that the guy was another matter. With such a pedigree and such talent, the kid is not bound by family or clan. And he even has the motive and desire to become a king. The boy can become the new king. No, a goblin has to become a king. While the boys were talking, the silhouette of a bird appeared in the sky. At this point, Choi asked for some time to think about it. It's just that everything has been happening too fast lately. While Guayu was happily confirming this, his sister was already flying above him, who had crushed her prey with her foot into the ground in anger. Gritting her teeth, Seol Mi continued to push her brother into the ground. The protagonist was shocked by this turn of events and watched as the magpie hit Guayu with all her might. From such a powerful attack, the turtle flew into the forest, crashing into a tree. Landing on its feet, Seol Mi began to use a unique magic, the wind feather. Seeing this, Choi tried to stop her. However, it was too late. The feathers were already released like arrows. Against the backdrop of the moon's reflection in the water, Shi Wu began to run to his friend, who said that everything was fine. She wouldn't even scratch him with this. Knowing Guiyu, he had probably already disappeared, anticipating his reprimand. The man she saw is not her real brother. In short, he has a split personality. The Black Turtle. According to legend, it was born from the union of a snake and a turtle, becoming one. However, if you trace their origin, their ancestor is the most common turtle. Once upon a time, 
Long ago, a genius realized the power of yin and yang. Over time, he separated them from his inner energy, then divided yin and yang among themselves, leaving only pure yin. Thus, he overcame his limit, awakening the divine power. This was the birth of the first black turtle. All of his descendants inherited his power to varying degrees. But in order to become a full-fledged black turtle, it was necessary to undergo incredibly painful training. And the snake became something like that for them. The second personality that Shi Wu had already seen. After listening to his friend, Choi said that Go Yu wasn't bad, even though he didn't seem so at first glance. Seo Mi agreed and said that her brother had no malice. The only problem is that he does things first and thinks later. He is also quite impulsive and selfish. And his antics cause a lot of headaches. In essence, he is a snake made up of negative energy. Perhaps that's why he has such a calm and cool temperament. He completely submits to his true personality, the turtle. In this duo, the snake was supposed to be the one who would do the strategizing and planning. However, in the case of my brother, there was something wrong with his snake from the very beginning. For some reason, it can take control of the body on its own. That's why Guayu is often in danger. For this reason, there were many people who disagreed with his candidacy as a clan representative at the festival. They even called him a half-turtle. When Seo Mi finished the story, she asked if Shu was ready. Choi simply nodded his head. Seeing his expression, she told him not to worry about it. It's not his fault. Even if someone was unhappy with their late return, it wouldn't be his problem. Hearing this, the goblin explained that this was not what worried him. It was the balcony. He had been gone for a month anyway. So now his mom would be very worried when she saw it. Suddenly, a third party interrupted the conversation. Turning around, the group saw Mangate, who said that they didn't have to worry about the repairs. There is a separate unit for this. And now, let's see Omi go back first. The man needs to talk to Shi Wu. Hearing this, the girl immediately began to explain that the boy was innocent. It's all her fault. Interrupting her, Mangate said that he already knew that. She just doesn't need to hear them talking. The three of them have something to discuss. The friends wondered who would be the third. Turning around, the judge said that it was not cultural to barge into the house like that, but there was nothing to be done about it. As the protagonist approached the exit, he saw Seol was standing in the hallway, saying that people generally live well. It's a little cramped, but it's done with taste. Shaking his head, Choi asked if she had gotten permission yet. The foxy woman replied that she had not. She doesn't have a secret benefactor, and she doesn't get 12-hour visits every six months. She didn't want to come to a world where she had to hide from prying eyes all the time. She was just pushed here. The old man said he would explain everything, but he still hasn't. Hearing this, Mangate said, adjusting his beard, that first, he needed to tell us what happened that evening. Right after sunset, about 50 ghosts appeared in Seoul, in the Siocho neighborhood. Someone was controlling them, and they were attacking people. When the yokai went to deal with them, it turned out that the ghosts acted quite rudely, not even trying to hide the traces of the crime. At the time, the man thought that this trick was organized to distract Seol Mi's attention, so that Sherwu would be left alone. But, after listening to Mangatai, the magpie asked in shock what the purpose of the crime was. In front of an attentive Siowa, the judge explained that this was not the only purpose. That evening, about 200 people went missing in Seoul. This news surprised the audience. Meanwhile, Mangate continued to say that this number was obtained on the basis of statements sent to the police. In reality, the number of missing people reaches at least 500. Panicking, Seol Mi said that it turns out that there are at least five yokai behind this plan, acting in an organized manner. They should do their best to create a list of suspects. Agreeing with this, Mangate added that if they are all Korean residents, it will not be difficult to catch them. However, some of the evidence he had seen at the crime scenes led him to have some discouraging thoughts. Many yokai from other regions have come to the Korean peninsula. They know that if they operate on their home territory, they will be caught quickly. So they started kidnapping people in Korea. If they can't catch the criminals, they will continue to hunt for the entire six months until the festival starts. Hearing this, Seol Wa couldn't believe her ears. At this point, Managatai continued to say that the yokai, who have the desire to protect the human world and the power to do so, 
need all the help they can get in this difficult time. So the man wants to offer them both something. An exam that was supposed to take place in a month. If they don't mind, it can be held in some other format right now. Find and destroy the criminals who invaded Korea. That's the task they now face. The next day, on his way to school, Yushin, who hadn't slept all night, thought that he shouldn't have let Shi Wu go. If that idiot didn't come back, the blame for his death would be on him. Suddenly, a joyful Choi brought him out of his thoughts, saying that he knew he could meet his friend on his way to school. Does he have a minute to spare? A lot has changed since they last spoke. After a while, the two boys were sitting in a cafe. After listening to Shi Wu, Yushin started shouting, attracting the attention of the customers. Asking him to be quieter, the protagonist apologized to the staff for the noise. Then he said that the conditions were not bad. At the very least, it would allow him to stay here instead of returning to the world of the yokai. And he wouldn't have to make his mom and him worry about themselves. Hearing this, Yushin grabbed his head, asking if Shio knew what class of yokai he belonged to. Choi replied that he did not know. In fact, he only found out yesterday that he was a yukai. Looking at his friend, the shaman said that the guy was Shin Ryong Kiyusu. Curious, Shiwu said he had never heard of it before. So Yushin began to explain that it was not just one word. Each of the five syllables symbolizes a yokai status. The lowest class is beasts. Su comes from hancha, which means beast, and is generally similar in meaning. Most yokai fall into this class. Although they are dangerous, these little things are not much different from wild animals. Their strength is also small. Their strength is in numbers, and usually people can handle this species, even if they, unlike them, cannot use magic. There have been many such cases in the past. A person with modern weapons is not threatened by these monsters at all. The situation with higher class yukai is different. An ordinary person cannot cope with them. Gyu, or monster. These are yukai that can be compared to a hundred people. And a hundred means their total physical strength. Therefore, in reality, even if a thousand people attack one of them, they will only die. After listening to his friend, Choi asked how strong the other three classes are if these two are inferior. A tired Yushin immediately replied that it would be a disaster. It was impossible to give an exact answer because the shaman himself had never met him. But roughly speaking, the key class is an energy that is ten times stronger than the Gyu class yokai. If you give them free reign, they can turn a small town into a branch of hell on earth overnight. If we talk about Seoul, such a yukai will not even leave a stone unturned from one of the city's districts. As for the yukai of the Shin class, the deity, and the Ryan class, the Seoul, you can't even approach them. Although the boys should not be in danger, these creatures don't often want to break the law. In any case, don't let Shiwu even think about taking part in the hunt by himself. Let him try to stay above the water, below the grass. If that doesn't work, the boy can go straight to the exorcist when he needs to lie low. If these yokai really came to Korea from other countries, then they must be confident in their strength and ability to withstand other yokai and shamans like him. It is not known how many of them there are, but even if there is someone of the key class, everything should be fine. After listening to his friend, Choi asked what class the snake was. Yushin replied that it was a small one. The monster was stronger than a Su, but not as strong as a Ki. Probably an average Gu A. The ghost it summoned was much stronger. If the snake could realize even half of the ghost's potential, then neither he nor Shi Wu would be alive. And by the way, the Yukai used the ghost to distract attention. Without reading his intentions right away, Choi would have already been eaten by that bastard. After he was done with that, Yushin pointed a finger at his friend, saying that the guy's class was even lower than that snake's. Maybe middle class, or even lower than a guy. Whether the guy is really a goblin, or just wants to believe it doesn't matter. There is no need to get involved in problems from which the guy will not be able to get out of it. From an objective point of view, he is a jerk. As Yushin continued to say hurtful words, he thought that he should just bury his friend's ideas right now to save him. While thinking about this, the shaman suddenly heard Choi happily say that if he fought that monster now, he would definitely win. As the exorcist had said, without his help, the boy would have died. But now everything is different. He realized how to use the power of the yokai correctly. He also feels more confident in battle. Listening to this, 
Yushin began to worry that his friend's way of thinking was worthless. At the end of the conversation, Shiwu reminded Yushin that it was time for school. Getting up, the shaman said that he had no intention of going to school today. It seems to him that Shiwu has not been able to draw the right conclusion from yesterday, so it is his friend's duty to help him. After a while, the boys were already at the Chamsal Olympic Stadium. The sports complex was built in 1986. It was built to host the gymnastics competitions of the Olympic Games in 1988 in Seoul. Now it is known as the largest concert hall and stadium of the Korean Sports Development Foundation. It has another purpose, which is not publicly known to anyone. The main character looked around, saying that he didn't even know there was an underground floor. On the way here, they passed many halls. Did all of this belong to the Yushin family? At that moment, the friends were in the Olympic Gymnastics Arena, an underground area, a public training center. Taking off his jacket, the shaman replied that everything was funded by the government. Not everything would belong to just one family. Hearing this, Choi asked if the government was aware of the Yokai Festival. With a sigh, Yushin explained that since ancient times, the government has always kept strong shamans around. Although not even like that. The strong shamans, long ago, created the concept of government themselves, because the forces that could resist monsters in the distant past were enough to unite people around them. 666 years ago, at the dawn of the Joseon dynasties, the threat from the yokai disappeared. However, the imperial family introduced the Constellation Hall, an organization that cultivated new shamans, and his family still continues to fulfill this ancient duty. The yokai, the festival, the ghosts, the rulers passed this knowledge from generation to generation. Nowadays, only high-ranking officials remember it, and even so, it doesn't seem like they take the whole situation seriously. However, this is enough if the guy is ready to not be attacked. Hearing this, Choi prepared for a fight. Rolling up his sleeves, Yushin added that he had already explained everything. There are no rules or time limits. If the young man could defeat him using all available methods, he wouldn't have to worry about anything happening to him. Hearing this, Shiwu asked if Yushin was going to use his sword that he had yesterday. Denying this, Yushin said that if he took the sword, there would be no point in the test. Although shamans have their own individual differences, in general, a shaman will usually be able to use less than half of his powers when he loses his weapon. Most of them are inseparable from their weapons and do not part with them under any circumstances. In the case of the young man, he can easily resist the Gyu Yokai with his bare hands alone. In other words, if Choi manages to defeat him, it will prove that he is stronger than the Gyu class. Having finished his explanation, Yushin began to approach Shi Wu. Seeing his frightened face, the exorcist asked why he did not attack. After collecting his thoughts, the protagonist prepared for the fight. Then, to the shaman's surprise, he rushed straight to his opponent, trying to grab him. Noticing his friend's hand near him, Yushin quickly knocked it away and swung his other hand, striking back several times. Choi was already on the verge of collapse. However, the exorcist himself took up the support with his foot and, with a turn, hit Shi Wu in the face with a powerful punch, from which the protagonist rode on the floor, leaving a trail. The fact that Yushin did not ask if Shi Wu was okay was due to the fact that such a question makes no sense. The shaman realized everything at the moment of impact. In addition, he had already witnessed Choi's regeneration skills. Therefore, his goal was to save his friend by fixing his brain without choosing any method. Rising to his feet, the protagonist wiped away the blood, saying that Yushin was like the main character of some manhwa. At this point, the exorcist wondered if he had suffered more from the blow than Shi Wu. He felt as if he had hit the wall with his fist with all his might. If he hadn't concentrated enough energy around his hand, he would have broken his bones. As the shaman thought about this, Shiwu realized that he would be fine even if his friend stopped holding back. And Yushin realized how dangerous a yokai he was fighting now. The conclusions they drew after the first attack were radically different. At this point, Choi went on the offensive. Taking off, the protagonist immediately headed for the shaman, trying to capture him. Watching his friend, Yushin reflected on the fact that his opponent had become much faster. However, his style of attack had not changed. While the exorcist was thinking about this, Shiwu grabbed his arm, 
Realizing the situation, the shaman turned around and kneed his friend in the face. Suddenly, Yushin felt something unusual. Ignoring the attack, Choi began to lift his opponent into the air, holding his hand. Unexpectedly, Shi Wu heard an angry shaman from above, chanting an incantation about the energy of all things that fills this world. Let him hear his request and become one with him. Frightened, the protagonist finally let go of the exorcist's hand. After that, he immediately received a powerful blow from the shaman, which could not be dodged and sent him into the wall. Landing on his feet, Yushin looked in Choi's direction, saying that Shi Wu was a piece of shit. The thing is in the hands of a boy. Is this what he thinks it is? Trying to summon his weapon, the protagonist replied that it seemed to be. For the first time, he managed to summon it of his own free will. There is one thing that needs to be explained. At the moment, the protagonist is not in the best condition. But he was able to get a club. He still has enough physical endurance. The problem is his spiritual energy. Last night in the battle, Choi used up about 93% of his total energy reserve. It will take about a day to fully replenish the reserve, but the rarefied environment of the human world slows down this process. It is ironic that the state of almost complete depletion of spiritual energy helped Shi Wu recreate the circumstances under which he managed to summon the Goblin Club last time. Although his body was not under his control then, his senses and instincts were sharpened, so he remembered everything in detail. And now he stands opposite his friend, ready for the second round. Looking at Choi, Yushin said that he had read about the Goblin Club in ancient chronicles. Perhaps the people who wrote them greatly exaggerated the superiority of such a weapon, or perhaps it was the owner himself. However, the look and feel of the club, it doesn't look very impressive. After hearing this, Choi said he didn't think so. Then, right before the exorcist's eyes, he jumped up and down swinging his new weapon, which he had summoned himself. As he approached his target and changed the shape of the club, Shi Wu said that the club did look more threatening last time. After blocking the blow with his hands, the shaman stood and reflected on the fact that Choi was stronger than expected. However, if he strengthened himself with spiritual energy, he would definitely not lose. A punch right after a long jump. It must have cost him a lot of effort. He needs to keep his distance, and then continue to defend until the opponent gets tired. While Yushin was thinking about this, Shi Wu stuck his club into the ceiling. Then he began to check if it was stuck well, saying that it should work. Looking at this, the exorcist asked in surprise what the young man was doing. The goblin replied that it was obvious. He could not win in close combat. It is unlikely that the shaman will be able to block this giant fist-like thing forever. At this point, the protagonist knew something for sure. Now he would not be able to use the same force with which he fought the last time. Neither the size nor the strength of the club. As a result, he won't have even half of his previous strength. However, he can still use several of the club's abilities. He can change its shape and manipulate it. Of course, the guy is cunning enough to take full advantage of this. So while changing shape, Choi threw his club at Yushin, who watched as a sphere the size of a soccer ball flew at him. Putting up a block, the exorcist began to resist the attack with all his might. Gritting his teeth, the shaman felt something. The blow was too strong, and he was knocked back by the force. Without waiting too long, Shi Wu was already swinging for the next attack, still concentrating on his club. Seeing that he was about to be attacked again, the shaman quickly moved. As a result, he successfully dodged the explosion caused by Choi's weapon with a jump. Watching this, the exorcist reflected on the fact that he did not see any changes in the energy of the club. Only the shape and manner of attack changes. And the force doubles. Landing with these thoughts, Yushin looked up at his friend, wondering if he would continue to play so cunningly. Smiling, Choi replied that perhaps he was not really being fair. Nevertheless, the shaman himself suggested a sparring match to determine whether the goblin could defeat the other yokai. And in a battle with monsters, you shouldn't avoid tricks. After all, when you fight to survive, there is no point in thinking about honor. Hearing this, Yushin gritted his teeth because he had nothing to say to such arguments. Meanwhile, with a satisfied smile, Shi Wu added that Yushin should not be ashamed. Just let him apologize to his friend. With that, the satisfied protagonist began to unwind his club again. 
Angry at his friend's self-confidence, the shaman also began to radiate his spiritual energy. Standing opposite Choi, Yushin looked at him. The latter looked at him and became irritated, saying that the yokai could not expect mercy. To this, Shiwu sarcastically replied that he was very scared. Having finished the conversation, the goblin attacked the shaman again with his weapon, creating a powerful explosion. Dodging, the exorcist saw his friend swing again, throwing a red ball of energy at him, which exploded on contact. As he dodged the attacks, Yushin reflected on the fact that, although he had accelerated, it was becoming harder and harder to dodge. However, the shaman had already begun to get used to his friend's fighting style. While he was thinking about this, Shiwu suddenly pulled his club back. Seeing this, the exorcist realized that it was a trap. Putting up a block, Yushin felt the impact of the goblin's weapon, which sent him into the wall a second later with a loud crash. Meanwhile, Choi was afraid for his friend, thinking that the blow was weaker than before, but Yushin could have been injured. With these thoughts in mind, the young man pulled the club back, but it suddenly pulled taut. Surprised, Shi Wu heard the shaman recite an incantation that the consolation of the righteous is a great blessing. The Lord is the only one who bears the burden of the law. By the will of the law, they turn to him for equality. Reciting this incantation, Yushin grabbed his club and did not let go with a smile on his face. Pointing his hand toward the yokai, the shaman said that the willow arrow should punish the sinner. After finishing his spell, the exorcist shot an arrow of magic at the goblin in front of him. Watching this, Shi Wu was not afraid and waited for the arrow to hit him. Suddenly, something happened that shocked him. The arrow cut his rope, which kept him hanging from the ceiling. Seeing his target falling, Yushin quickly rushed to him. Realizing the situation, Choi pulled his ball back. The club began to quickly return to its owner. Turning around, the shaman noticed that he was being attacked again. Dodging the insidious blow, the exorcist began to recite the next spell saying that the regalia of the Moonlight Monarch, which changed the color of the red sky. As he said this, Yushin realized that he did not have the ritual weapon that would allow him to use many techniques. Because of this, he was unable to use most of his techniques. In addition, even if he could use them on his opponent in front of him, it would be extremely difficult to control them. So now, he would end the spell by approaching Shi Wu and saying that by the will of the law, he would ask for equality. From his own spiritual energy, he recreated the weapon with divine power. And he confronted Choi, who used a weapon of his own kind, also controlling it with spiritual energy. And even though the shaman created this sword in a hurry, he still fought back, meeting his comrade on equal terms. However, not a single yukai could have coped with such a force. Therefore, Shi Wu's club was destroyed. And Yushin himself, a moment before the end of the blow, hesitated because his opponent was his friend. For the same reason, he found the strength to bring the fight to an end. And although Choi did not want to give up by swinging his fist to strike, the shaman was unstoppable. Having dodged, the exorcist was about to lunge, but suddenly he noticed something. His weapon of spiritual energy began to disappear. Because of this annoyance, he missed Shi Wu's fist, which crashed right into the guy's face. Afterwards, looking at his friend, Choi asked why the exorcist had succumbed. Even if the shaman had wounded him, the goblin would still regenerate. Yushin replied that this was not the case. He put all his strength into his technique. If his opponent was a yukai, even a ki, he would have been cut in half, just like a goblin's club. It was just that the technique itself recognized the guy as a human, not a yukai. Fuck. Shi Wu is an asshole. With these words, tears appeared on the face of the defeated shaman. The next day, Yushin went to school with a band-aid on his nose. Puzzling Choi, the shaman suddenly said that he was annoyed by the way the boy silently hovered around him with a worried look. To this, Shi Wu said that he just wanted to know if his friend was okay. If his nose is broken, interrupting him, the exorcist clarified that this would not happen. He may not be a yokai, but his body is still hardened by countless training sessions. A broken bone or torn skin would heal in a day. In addition, the guy had reduced his strength the moment before the blow. He must have realized that the shaman's ability did not work, so he weakened the attack as much as he could. Otherwise, the nose would have turned to mush. 
Still, it was a good fight. Since the goblin is so eager to run around the streets looking for monsters, no one will stop him now. Although the shaman still disagrees with his friend's decision, but a deal is a deal. With these words, Yushin started looking for something in his backpack. Then he handed it to the surprised Choi. Handing the amulet made of pumpkins to his friend, the exorcist explained that it was a kind of consumable, although they can be considered an analog of a granat. To activate it, you need to squeeze it in your hand and say Savaha. If there is little time, you just need to throw it into the ground. With the strength of a goblin, it will probably be enough to squeeze the bottle a little to activate the alchemical formula inside. They should be used only in emergency situations and never break them more than once. Looking at the gift with a sad look, Choi asked if he could really accept it. Seeing his friend's surprise, Shi Wu clarified that the bottles contained Yushin's energy and in incredible quantities. Making them must have been no easy task. Puzzled by this insight, the shaman asked if the boy had seen this before. Choi replied that he hadn't. Just by touching the gift, he felt the energy trapped inside. And this is the same energy he felt during yesterday's battle. It is inside the pumpkins, in an incredible amount. At that moment, the protagonist's guess was true. The colored pumpkins were Dharma storage devices used mainly by Yushin's family members. After the bottle is coated with a special solution, it becomes capable of accumulating and storing the energy of the owner when he decides to pour it into the vessel. This allows shamans to use techniques that require large reserves of energy at any time and regardless of the situation. In addition, even if it is not their own energy, anyone can use such a bottle by releasing its contents. Knowing this information, Yushin thought that the solution covering the vessel sealed the energy inside, and the boy was able to feel it through this barrier, and he also determined how much energy was there. With these thoughts in mind, the shaman asked his friend to give him his hand. Not realizing what was going on, Shiwu held out his palms. They say that you can tell your own fate by the location of a line on your palm. However, this is complete nonsense. But you can still find out something, and that's what Yushin is doing now. Having finished the examination, the puzzled shaman began to think that his friend had not just keen senses, it was a real talent. Of course, chiromancy cannot boast of 100% accuracy, but the fact that the goblin can sense the energy inside the colored vessel and its fighting style leaves no doubt. While the exorcist was thinking about this, Choi saw his friend's confused face, and he asked what happened to him. Meanwhile, looking at his friend, Yushin continued to think that if the boy hadn't been a yokai, the shaman would have immediately run to ask his father for permission. However, in this unique case, even permission would not have been necessary. With Shi Wu's talent, even if he had become a disciple without being a member of the clan, no one would have said a word. Maybe it's not too late? Although there's no way to hide the fact that the boy is a yukai, there's no doubt that he's half-human and his willpower. But no, those stubborn idiots won't do that even if they're threatened with death. Except that they won't give permission, there's a good chance the situation could be misunderstood. A goblin with the talent of a shaman? If it wasn't Shiwu, the exorcist himself would look down on such a person. If only it had been known at least three days earlier. Having finished his thoughts, Yushin said that he was just thinking about his friend's confusing fate. Anyway, when is the guy planning to return to school? Hearing this, Shio looked at his clothes, saying that he needed a new school uniform to start with. Because he has nothing to wear but a tracksuit. It seems that even his foot size has decreased. Smiling, Yushin said that he was eager to see the reaction of his classmates. I wonder how many people will recognize this Shiwu? While the shaman was waiting for this moment, an irritated Choi said that his head hurt just thinking about it. Glancing at his watch, Yushin offered to eat. Agreeing, the goblin said they could go to a cafe nearby. Looking at him, the shaman asked why they couldn't go to Shi Wu's house. Last time he had made such delicious fried rice with kimchi. Smiling awkwardly, the protagonist replied that there was a little problem with that. He has guests right now, and they are probably still sleeping. And in the afternoon, he needs to go to one place. Shocked by his friend's words, Yushin sighed, stopping him and saying that Shi Wu didn't need to make excuses. He had already said that whatever the boy was doing with the Yokoyama was his business. And since the boy is busy today, the shaman will just go to school. And they will have lunch the next time. 
and don't even let the boy look so upset. He has a meeting soon, so he needs to straighten up and act confident. After finishing this conversation, the protagonist immediately headed to the meeting place. Arriving at the abandoned neighborhood, Choi looked around thinking that this place looks very strange. Most of the houses were empty. With these thoughts, Shi Wu approached the entrance. As he looked at it, he wondered what it said. The rising dark moon? Suddenly, a man with a menacing look opened the door. Looking at him, Choi realized that it was a yukai, and a very strong one at that. While he was thinking about it, the man simply walked away, ignoring the boy. Suddenly, someone called out to Shi Wu from the aisle, saying that she hadn't seen him here before. When he turned around, the goblin saw a woman greeting him, saying that her name was Hong Ryong, a representative of the rising dark moon. Hearing this, Choi also greeted him, introducing himself and saying that the judge had told him about this place yesterday, giving him the address and advising him to visit. Demonstrating the entrance that led into the darkness, the woman said she had already heard about Shi Wu from an elder, so he could go through. Once inside, the protagonist began to think that it was not just dark. It feels as if the room is filled with black fog. Moving on, Choi, to his surprise, found himself in a bright place, in front of a traditional style mansion. Once inside, Hong poured tea for the guest. Embarrassed, Shi Wu thanked her for the treat. Holding the cup, he asked if they were still in Seoul. The scenery here is just amazing. To this, Ryan replied that the home of the ascending dark place is a space that exists separately from the human world. Since it was separated from civilization and progress for centuries, the beauty and clean air have remained unchanged to this day. Here, you could say, there is a store that provides various goods to the yokai to help them adapt to the human world. After listening to the woman, Choi thought about what Mongadai had said, just to look at this place. But, with these thoughts, Shi Wu summoned the scroll, demonstrating the contents of the chest to the joyful Hong. The boy said that he had been told that this was the currency of the yokai world. Could he buy something here with it? Looking at the coins, Ryan replied that the boy could either buy something with them or exchange them. Many people exchange ghost faces for the currency of the country they live in. If exchanged at the current exchange rate, one yang would be equal to about three million won. At this news, Shi Wu could not say a word. At the age of 17, he had no more than 720,000 won in his account. Ignoring her visitor's surprise, Ryan invited him to take a look at their goods. Their first lot was spirit pills. Hearing this, the worker immediately brought a chest. Opening it, the yokai looked at the differently colored pills lying on a silk pillow. Looking at them, Choi listened to the explanation that these were the best-selling items in their store. The pills speed up the restoration of spiritual energy. As you know, the human world is poor in spiritual energy, and even in the world of the yokai, energy recovery is a slow process. Therefore, here, in the House of the Rising Dark Moon, according to their secret recipe, they combined many medicinal herbs from the yokai world into one pill. So that even in an unfavorable environment where natural recovery is difficult, the yokai could solve this problem by simply eating the pill. After hearing this, Choi asked if they differed in terms of packaging color. Confirming this, Hong explained that the pills of different grades are packaged in different packages. One coin can buy 10 silver pills, or 3 gold pills, or 1 black pill. The higher the class of the pill, the stronger the effectiveness, the energy recovery. Therefore, if a guy wants to fully restore his energy, let him take a black one. Thinking about this suggestion, to the woman's delight, Shi Wu said he would take the black one. And can he use it right now? With a sly smile, Ryan confirmed this, saying that the effect should be visible in the evening. After that, Hong began to think that this applies to any class of pills. And as for the energy of yokai, there are two factors to consider when evaluating it. The size of the niden and the rate of energy absorption. The size of the niden reflects the maximum amount of energy that a yokai can store, and it increases with age and when other yokai are eaten. However, the ability to absorb energy, which determines how fast a yokai will regenerate energy by absorbing it from its surroundings and opponents, is almost impossible to improve after birth. It depends to a large extent on talent and pedigree. High-ranked yokai will be able to digest the black pill in about 3 to 4 hours, but for someone of a low level, the guy might not even be able to digest half of the energy after a few days. 
And yet, she wasn't lying. After digesting even a small part of the pill, he would be able to restore his small supply by nightfall. In her estimation, the black pill was too much for Shi Wu. One of them would be enough to restore his energy three or four times. Suddenly, a flash brought Hong's joyful thoughts out of her thoughts. At the same second, a column of light energy rushed up from the mansion. This event turned the room upside down. At that moment, Ryan realized that her statements were false. Looking in the direction of the young man, she thought that this could not be possible. Not even a minute had passed since the boy had eaten the pill, and in such a short time, he had absorbed so much energy that he had caused an overload? While Hong was thinking about this, the protagonist sighed, and looking at his body filled with energy, he said that this pill was too powerful for a beginner. With these words, Choi felt all 100%, and perhaps even more, of his energy for the first time in three days since becoming a yokai.